Good morning. We welcome you. We're so glad that you're here for this meaningful service. The first service was just terrific. I think you will be blessed as well. Two quick announcements before the prelude is played. Number one, we'll not be passing the offering plates this morning. So if you have an offering on your way out, you can put it in one of those sil silver receptacles. The concert, uh, the program is entitled Clinging to Hope. And uh, Pastor Chuck published a book on that subject several months ago, so we've asked IFL if they would bring copies and have them available for you to purchase in the foyer on your way out. Uh, today only, special price, two books for the price of three. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, just kidding. It I I've read it from cover to cover, and it is a great book. Now let's listen to our orchestra play the prelude, Fairest Lord Jesus.
Well, sitting here this morning, I was remembering vividly that when we founded our church uh, almost 25 years ago, I, I recall making the statement, we want to be known as a place that faithfully proclaims the word of God, and we also want to be a church that provides great music. Uh, Don McManus... I'm so grateful that Don McMahon and the other conductors have taken that last commitment to new heights and that we have this spring concert along with a whole series of concerts through the year and that you're able to enjoy this one, clinging to hope. Could there be a, a, a better theme than that? I don't think there could be. If you're a guest of ours, we're glad you're here to be a part of this time together. We look upon these times as occasions for worship, not just listening to music or listening to words in a narration, but worshiping the Lord our God. So uh, would you stand together, we'll just stand right where you are, and let me ask you to do something special. Normally we have you greet one another, so that you will not feel alone. And we certainly want to welcome you who are online. Special welcome to you, as always. But I want you to take this uh, as an occasion to thank our choir, our orchestra, and our conductors for the hard work that's gone into this concert. Would you do that? Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being in your house today and for hearing the songs of the faith, some familiar, others not so, and yet all of them conveying a message of hope. Bring us to a place where we realize that hope is available and it comes through the Savior, Jesus Christ. We wish to honor your son today and exalt your name, Father, as we bring our music before you and before your people. Be pleased with these efforts as we blend words with music to declare that the hope you offer is a hope worth clinging to. In the name of Christ, we pray this, God's people said. Amen. Please be seated.
my salvation I cry out to you by day I come to you at night now hear my prayer listen to my cry for my life is full of troubles and death draws near I am as good as dead like a strong man with no strength left they have left me among the dead and I lie like a corpse in a grave I am forgotten Cut off from your care. You have thrown me into the lowest pit, into the darkest depths. Your anger weighs me down with wave after wave. You have engulfed me. You have driven my friends from me by making me repulsive to them. Each day I cry to you for help, O oh Lord. I lift my hands to you for mercy. Are your wonderful deeds of any use to the dead? Do the dead rise up and praise you? Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? Can they proclaim your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Can the darkness speak of your wonderful deeds? Can anyone in the land of forgetfulness, talk about your righteousness? Oh Lord, I cry out to you. I will keep on pleading day by day. Oh Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? I have been sick and close to death since my youth. I stand helpless and desperate before your terrors. Your fierce anger has overwhelmed me. Your terrors have paralyzed me. They swirl around me like floodwaters all day long. They have engulfed me completely. You have taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. Of the psalmist, the one who lifts our spirits and gives us a song to sing, the one who is on the mountaintop shouting, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So it reads in Psalm 27, but when you, when you move to Psalm 88, darkness has come. In only a matter of moments, everything has changed for David. He's no longer on the mountaintop. He's been cast into a valley. It isn't a place of victory, it's a place of defeat, discouragement, depression. He even says so. And he doesn't hide his feelings. He blames God. You threw me down here. It's like I'm in a grave. How can I go on? The one who said, he's my light and my salvation is now in such darkness he can't see around him. Talk about a major mood swing. 
But before we have room to criticize the psalmist, we have to look into our own hearts and say, we've been there. We've known such feelings. We can begin a day on the top, and before that day has reached sunset, we're at the bottom. It sounds like the psalmist is friendless, aimless, helpless. But what is really happening is he is hopeless. Is there anything worse than that? I mean, hope has become axiomatic for life itself. It gives us the determination to press on. But take away hope, the pressing on stops. Prisoners of war who linger and languish in their cells without hope die. Athletic teams who lose hope in the game fall into a slump and they stay there through the rest of the season, all things being equal. Fledgling writers who have looked forward to that book they've always wanted to write, but let hope fail, and they toss aside their pen, and that novel never gets written, that book, that biography. The lack of hope has stolen the motivation. Someone has put it well, we can live years without a friend. We can go about 40 days without food four, five, maybe six days without water, we can go eight minutes without air, but without hope, in seconds, we're in that grave-like existence, like the psalmist. How can we pull out of it? What can we do to bring back the hope we once had so that we're able to get back on the winning side, recover from an illness, write that book, finish that course rather than drop out? I'll tell you, hope sometimes needs a companion, and there's no better companion for hope than our memory. We need to remember former days, days when the Lord met our needs in a special way and, and we recovered. And when we call that to mind, it does something to our current discouragement. That happens to the psalmist himself. He personally writes of such a thing. He says, my voice rises to God. I, I will cry aloud to him. My voice rises and he will hear me. I have I've thought about the former days. He's remembering. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago and And I remembered my song in the night. My song in the night.
Did you hear that? Did, did, did you hear? I lift my eyes up, 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 up. I won't be caught staring down, down, down at the pettiness of life, the troubles of those all about us, the details of my struggles. I'm going to lift my eyes up, up. It may be a hill. It may be a snow-capped mountain. If you're ever among the redwoods, you have to look up, up, and you're impressed all over again with the him who made the heavens and the earth. You realize that when the writer of that song put his lyrics together, he drew from the oldest words in the Bible. The words Moses used when he picked up the stylus and wrote Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashem Hayim In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word means created out of nothing. Before there was matter, before there were any of the elements, with fiat word and power he created. I lift up my eyes to him who can do something out of nothing and bring about solutions where I only see problems. That's hope, the intense sense of expectation. That's what is, that's what is brought about when you lift up your eyes and you remember the one who made heaven and earth. The Hashimayim, the heavens, the galaxy. And so I struggle with how do we convey the significance, the vastness of just our galaxy? Uh, there, there are no doubt hundreds of thousands of them. Some would say millions, other galaxies. But let's limit it just to ours. Let's see if we can get our, our, our heads around it. Let's take a trip together. To keep from that journey lasting forever, we'll have to travel the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. And we can't take time for all the orbiting to leave the gravity pull of this earth and to enter into others. We're going to go straight from here to there. You know how long traveling that fast it would take you to get to the moon? One and one third seconds. Traveling at that speed. Can you guess how long it would take you to get to the nearest star in our galaxy? Four years. That's the nearest star. And that's just in our immediate Hashimayim. He's the one who made heaven and earth. He put those planets in space. How quickly we can spend our lives and ignore the vastness of his workmanship which revealed the glory of God. New York City's famous Hayden Planetarium, if you're ever there, will help you realize the vastness of it all. It is a miniature replica of our solar system, just ours. And it shows the distances and the sizes of of our planets. What's interesting is that the three outer planets are not even included. There wasn't room for them, for, 
for them to be included, Uranus would be in, in the corridor of the planetarium. Neptune would take you down to 8th Avenue and Pluto all the way to 5th Avenue. Another three long avenues away. And no stars are included. Of course not. There wouldn't be room for any of them. On that same scale, where would the nearest star be? Cleveland, Ohio. But we're not through. We're just getting started. And this is, remember, just our local galaxy. A scientist once suggested another fascinating analogy. To grasp the scene, imagine a perfectly smooth glass pavement on which the tiniest speck can be seen. And then shrink our sun from its 865,000 miles in diameter down to two feet. And place that two-foot ball on the glass pavement. Now we begin to mark off the spaces. If you step off 82 paces, representing about two feet per pace, to represent the first planet you would arrive at, Mercury, let's put down a, a tiny mustard seed. Take another 60 steps for Venus and place an ordinary BB. Walk 78 more steps and put down a, a green pea. You guessed it. That's us. That's Earth. Step off 108 more paces from there and you arrive at Mars. Let's let a pinhead represent Mars. Now we need to sprinkle around some fine dust for asteroids and then take 788 more steps and place an orange on the glass for Jupiter. After 988 more steps, put down a golf ball representing Saturn. Now, now it gets really involved. Put on your walking shoes, walk 2,086 more steps to arrive at Uranus. A marble represents that planet. Another 2,322 steps from there and you arrive at Neptune. Let's let a cherry represent Neptune. And we haven't even mentioned Pluto. We have a smooth glass surface five miles in diameter, yet it's just a fraction of the heavens, the Hashimayim, which he has made out of nothing, excluding Pluto. Now, guess how far we'd have to go with these dimensions to reach the nearest star? 6,720 miles, not paces, miles, nearest star. And there are multiple billions of them. And don't forget, this all is moving in perpetual motion, perfectly synchronized to create the most accurate timepiece known to humanity. And some wonder why I say we need to reserve the word awesome for God. Please. He's the one who says, lift up your eyes to the hills. You need hope? Remember who made heaven and earth. And this has just been a short trip. Our eyes fixed on the hills will help revive our hope. He is the one on whom we call, and we can be sure he hears. 
and on whom we wait, knowing that in his time and in his way, he will carry out his mysterious will. When we do those things, not only, he not only sends us help, he renews our strength. <laughs> and invariably, he revives our hope. Invariably.
all of us, uh, each of us, have and probably will encounter hopelessness. It will come to us. My biggest encounter with the severity of hopelessness came about 29 years ago. My family and I had just moved back to the Metroplex. There was a change of job, employment for me, and some other stressful factors. And I soon found myself sinking into a deep clinical depression. Uh, so severe was it that uh, every day it seemed like I was walking through a fog. I could see about a foot in front of my face, but, but nothing else. I'm grateful that a doctor prescribed the right medication for me. I went on an antidepressant, and that helped. It took about two months to pull me back to normal, but I'm grateful for medicine. Another thing I learned during that time is there's another antidote uh, for hopelessness and feelings like it, and, and that is music, <laughs> sacred songs, the songs of our faith. They have a way of, of uh, ministering to our souls and uh, pouring oil upon a parched heart. During that time of depression, I would often go uh, to sleep early, about 6 o'clock in the evening, because I found that my uh, waking hours were, were very painful. And, but when I uh, sleep, I escaped it all. So one night I went to, to sleep about 6 in the evening. My daughters at that time were 14 and 16. Uh, they were both uh, quite accomplished on the violin. And uh, about an hour after I had gone to sleep, uh, I heard music being played. And uh, I barely opened my eyes up, and, and there was Sarah and Lauren uh, serenading me with songs of the faith. And the first one they played is one that we're going to sing together in a moment. It's called, God Will Make a Way Where There Seems to Be No Way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. They played that over and over again. It's a short song, so sometimes Sarah would play the melody and Lauren the harmony, and they'd, they'd flip. And, and then they started, they, they segued right into some other uh, hymns of our faith, uh, Amazing Grace. Now there's, and I remember just the, the soothing sound uh, of that music uh, wafting over my heart. So uh, never underestimate uh, the power of music. Uh, during those times of struggle. We're going to sing three songs of our faith that will encourage our hearts. Please pay close attention to the words. The first is, God will make a way. Would you stand, please, as we sing? <clears throat>
For 33 consecutive years, Donald Gray Barnhouse remained the senior pastor of 10th Memorial Presbyterian Church in the city of Philadelphia. During those years, he became known as one of the finest expositors in America. He was also involved in a radio broadcast, somewhat unique in that era. And before his death in 1960, he had been ministering for 14 years on the radio, and each broadcast featured another phase of the letter to the Romans, which he never completed. Donald Barnhouse not only loved the word of God, the longer he preached and the more God used him, the greater he loved the God of the word. One of his favorite sessions is what he called Open Forum. Occasionally on Sunday evenings, the church would be open early. He would appear with just his Bible in hand and would stand behind a freestanding microphone and would field questions from the congregation, which was usually packed out, including the balcony where students from universities all around loved to gather. They especially liked asking questions that seemed as though no one could ever answer. And they would often wait for his answer with a great deal of interest. He found delight in skeptical students who would sometime try to stump him. <laughs> On one occasion, a student shouted out from the balcony, Dr. Barnhouse, can you tell us how the ancient Hebrews could walk for 40 years across the wilderness and their clothing never needed to be replaced and their sandals never wore out. How on earth could that have happened? Barnhouse answered immediately, God. Nobody could say God like Barnhouse, except maybe W.A. Criswell. He had the same sound, God. And the kid in the balcony said, oh, okay, now I understand. Barnhouse shot back, no, you don't, son. Nobody understands. What a great answer. The sooner we're willing to say we don't understand and we cannot imagine the workings of God, the greater will be our inner peace. As faith comes on board and reason takes a hike, we relax within and realize God alone is God. There is none other. There is none other. There is nothing about him that is like us and that troubles the humanist who always wants to somehow reason through God and find a, a place to explain the inexplicable. How difficult it is for puny humanity to acknowledge ignorance. God is at work. His ways are behind, beyond our comprehension. Wisdom starts when we acknowledge that. His paths are unpredictable. His will often mysterious and sometimes miraculous. And because that is true, we must quickly acknowledge what has been pointed out so beautifully by, by the pianist Michael W. Smith in seven words where he stated, God is God and I am not. As
as that becomes clearer and clearer to us, we will find peace in resting in our God. We will, be, we will accept the fact that we can't explain all sicknesses and most deaths or the timing of such. And why this occurs to us and not to him or her. God is up to something and he is never obligated to explain his reason. One of my most trusted Hebrew teachers, Dr. Bruce Walke, used to say he has lived long enough to realize that God rarely explains why. Paul set aside a doxology in his letter to Timothy. And after giving his testimony, where he honestly and openly told of his own past, which was in many ways deplorable and brutal, he simply wrote, Now to the King eternal, immortal, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Having lived through the bloody war between the states, Walter Chalmers Smith wrote a hymn. He put his lyrics to the tune of an old Welsh hymn as he wrote Immortal, Invisible, God only wise, in light and accessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, that great name we praise. Thy great name we praise. You need hope. Turn to the one who has always been there, who put the stars in the spaces. I've always loved it that in the Genesis account, one half a verse addresses his creating the stars. Check it out for yourself in Genesis 1. It reads, he made the stars also, period. <laughs> Isn't that great? If we were to do it, we'd write nine volumes on it. He writes half a sentence. God is at work in light and accessible hid from our eyes. May we never, ever forget that he is God and God alone. And we are not. And when our, our hope wears thin, we turn to the one who never runs out of it and waits to give it to us. All we must do is wait for him to reveal himself. For after all, he has been faithful to us every day of our lives, every day. One through eight is on the screen. Let us join our voices together in reading the scripture. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. O oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him. 
for God is our refuge.
For several weeks, Cynthia and I have looked forward with great anticipation to this particular concert. Uh, not only because uh, we were surprised that, that the theme chosen was from a book I'd written recently, but because uh, this concert was to be held on June the 18th, our 68th wedding anniversary. Now you talk about clinging to hope. We were so young, we didn't have anything else to cling to. But we had each other. And uh, when it came to assets, well, if you'd count a used seven-year-old Chevy coupe that held everything we owned, or if you would include a little tiny cottage we bought in a blue-collar community, thanks to the gift of my dear maternal grandfather, uh, we really had nothing. Cynthia had no job. I was an apprentice in a machine shop, just gotten a raise up to $1.27 an hour, so we were rolling in it, you know? <laughs> We were living on love. <laughs> but we had the Lord. And without trying to parade our piety, we have leaned on him every year of our lives together. And who would have ever guessed? We bought a little little cottage type place along a grimy ship channel that carried the oil tankers into the sprawling metropolis of Houston. And there we lived for a couple of years, had no idea what the future would hold. We had refinished all the furniture that we would put in that little place. And then a hitch in the Marine Corps took me away for a number of months and then brought us back. And of all things, we were accepted at Dallas Seminary and then left the school and ultimately after graduation and a couple of three more years with a dear mentor, Dr. Pentecost, we moved up to New England. Then we came back to Texas. And then out of the blue, God led us to California. I'd always said there are three places I would never minister once I graduated. Texas, New England, and California. <laughs> Those are the only places I've ministered. And by God's grace, after 23 years out there and rearing our children from uh, just little children all the way up to marriageable age, God led us, of all things, back to Dallas. <laughs> it always reminded me of that great theologian, Waylon Jennings, and what he wrote, <laughs> splintered wood, rusty chains. This old front porch swing remains a pendulum of memories swinging back and forth on a summer breeze, singing old church hymns and nursery rhymes from the days way back before our time. With a little child upon my knee, singing every sweet word back to me. Look how far we had to come to get back where we started from, with the child's wisdom passing time, singing old church hymns and nursery rhymes. It occurred to me that you may be here without a song, without a, a solid rock to stand on, without a hope to cling to, 
Surely in a group this large, there are some of you who would have to admit that if you died tonight, it would be the worst night of your life. You'd have to face the one who created you. And you're not on speaking terms with his son, even though he's made his son available to every one of us. He led you here to this concert. He, if you will, dangled the hope in front of you that you can cling to, but it's all a mirage without Christ. So we dedicate the last song to you. I've asked several of our pastors and pastoral leaders, the leadership team of our staff, to gather across the front here, knowing that some of you would like to talk to someone, but you don't know quite how to do that. You don't know what someone might say when you tell them your story. I will tell you for sure, these people know how to listen, and they will keep your secret. They will help you find your way to hope that you can cling to for the rest of your life. The reason we find such happiness in what we do here is we live our lives on a solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand and so we trust in the one who will be there through eternity. His name is Jesus, and we don't want to keep him to ourselves. We want to share him with each one of you. So if you're here without him, these folks are here to talk with you. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to stand and sing with us on Christ, the solid rock I stand. But first, Please bow with me. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us. Indeed, you have been faithful. Thank you for never forgetting us, always being available to us. And even though we have walked away from you, you have never come close to walking away from us. All other ground is sinking sand. And so we stand upon the rock of Christ. Thank you that it never gives way and that our hope is sure in him. Be pleased with the way this music finds its way into hearts in the days and years to come as people are reminded that there is hope to be gleaned from a relationship with you. May some come to know you even this day at this place. In the name of Jesus, all of us pray, and we all say together, amen. Now please stand for the singing of this fine hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand.
before you go, we'd love to know how we can care for you. Visit stonebriar.org slash guest to fill out a guest card where you can introduce yourself, share a prayer request, and find ways you can connect with our church family. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday. Have a great week.